A mysterious death inside this Connecticut home leaves a community stunned. In 26 years, I have never seen a case like this. A wife found dead, and cops say it may not be an accident. Somebody caused this homicide. Inside, they find the body of Sandra Koloski. Her death is ruled a homicide. They classified it as a homicide with blunt trauma. According to the medical examiner, the 56-year-old wife and stepmother died from blunt injuries to the head and upper extremities. Bill Griffin is a retired Connecticut state trooper. Blunt trauma and blunt force trauma. It's the difference between falling down the stairs and being beaten to death with a hammer. Is Correct. Right? Well, homicide is death at the hands of another human being. Yeah. Somebody caused this homicide. No arrests have been made. No suspects or persons of interest named. Police say the case remains under investigation and there is no threat to the public. But so far, that's all they've said about the mysterious death of Sandra Koloski. It's very strange. There's been almost no news, no information out there as to how this woman died, why she died. Suspicious deaths are very rare in East Hannah. But interestingly enough, the most mysterious one that's remembered here occurred nearly 19 years to the day from when Sandy was found dead. February 1999, Paula Koloski is found shot to death in her bed, in the same home where Sandra died. Coincidence? Okay, is there a gun in the area? Is she bleeding? Take a deep breath, okay? Calm down. Jeff, what's your name? Both women were married to Robert Koloski at the time of their deaths. 19 years ago, Paula's husband, Robert, was the one who called 911 after making the gruesome discovery in their bedroom. Okay, Bob, tell me what's going on. Stand up. Listen, in your nose and out your mouth. How did you hear your sister had died? I got a call from the state police. They said, uh, there's a problem with your sister. You have to come immediately. Growing up, John Carbo says he and Paula were inseparable siblings. We acted, uh, in a sense, like twins and she was my best friend. The two never went more than a couple days without talking. My sister wanted to bring a sense of style, a sense of class, and a sense of uh, dignity to everything she did. John says Paula, who was a hardworking go-getter, met Robert, who was getting divorced in her early 20s. How did she meet this Robert Koloski? She was working at Aetna, and she was beginning to enter middle management. And uh, Bob Kolofsky was working as a um, person who would fill up the vending machines. So they struck up a relationship. And at that time, he told her that his name was Bob Cornish. And uh, he told her that he graduated with a degree in music, but couldn't find a degree teaching. Later, uh, we found out all of that was a lie. The two eventually married. But now on a cold Connecticut morning, after racing to her home, John was told his sister had taken her own life. The scene was something like out of a movie. It was surrealistic. John, who is a marriage and family therapist, says he was alarmed by Robert's behavior. And that was probably one of the most frightening things I've ever seen. He says his brother-in-law was walking around in a bathrobe, dazed and confused. He was moaning. He was making sounds almost like an animal. Based upon your training as a therapist, somebody very familiar with psychology, what do you think was going on with him? He had a, an acute trauma. I mean, he was like a soldier who had gone into battle. Robert Koloski claims on the morning he found his wife dead, he woke up around 7 o'clock, made coffee, and went out to run errands. He goes to the bank and he withdraws $6,000 from savings to checking. And he goes to the gas station and of course he has all his receipts. When he returned, he says he heard what he thought was his wife snoring. After a while, he went to check on her and found her shot to death in the bed. John says from the moment he walked into his sister's house, he pleaded with cops, insisting there was no way she would have killed herself. 
His pleas fell on deaf ears. Mr. Kowalski had told the police that my sister was depressed because my mother had passed away five months earlier. John says he and his sister were both sad about their mother's passing, but her death wasn't a shock. She had long battled cancer. No. You knew it was coming. Yes, we knew it was coming. No one wants their family members to be in pain. No one wants that. Even Robert said she would never mentioned suicide before. But none of that seemed to matter to detectives. They'd already made their determination. There was a narrative taking place that my sister was depressed and this is why she did it. This narrative took hold and it just, it just had a life of its own. John says there was plenty of evidence to suggest his sister wasn't suicidal and had everything to live for. A week before uh, this event happened, my sister was fitted for a cap and gown. She was going to be graduating from college at the University of Hartford with honors uh, in a degree in business. Also, just two weeks earlier, she'd received a big bonus at work. And John says Paula was a proud mom who had a great relationship with her nine-year-old son. The afternoon before she passes away, she went to the dentist to have her teeth cleaned. Now, these are not the actions of somebody who's contemplating suicide. You're a therapist. Yes, I, it's, it's just impossible. It's not just John's professional opinion that his sister wasn't suicidal. We actually hired from Dartmouth an expert on suicide, and he analyzed all of the facts of Paula Koloski's life, and he concluded she had no risk factors for suicide. So if Paula Koloski didn't kill herself, then how did she end up with a bullet in her head? When Sandra Koloski was found dead inside her Connecticut home in March, people in East Haddam were stunned. And not just because her death was ruled a homicide by blunt trauma to the head. What are the odds that two women, wives of the same man, die in the same house? I'm not aware of it happening before. 19 years before Sandra's death, Robert Koloski's then wife, Paula, also died a violent death inside the home on North Moodis Road. Robert was the one who found her in bed, a bullet through the head. In the short time it took Paula's brother John Carbo to drive over to her house, cops had already determined a cause of death. The officer greets me at the door telling me that my sister has committed suicide. Paula Koloski's cause of death was officially ruled a suicide by the deputy chief medical examiner. His primary reason for the ruling. The reason why he concluded that it was a suicide was really based upon the police report that was provided to him. Is there any way she could have committed suicide? None. Absolutely none. But was critical evidence in the case overlooked by investigators? Was the ball dropped here? I think there may have been some foregone conclusions, you know, initially when they responded. Paula's heartbroken brother was determined to prove that his sister didn't take her life. I requested all the information from the state. But you're not a trained detective. <clears throat> True, absolutely. But when you looked at the crime scene pictures, it was a staged event. The first thing John found suspicious, the family photos placed on the bed surrounding his sister's body. The pictures are facing out. Why does that seem strange to you? Well, if you're in bed and these pictures are going to be your last pictures or objects that you're going to look at in this lifetime, why wouldn't they be facing you? And that wasn't even the strangest issue with the photos. If she shot herself after looking at the photos, you'd think that there would be blood all over the photos. But there doesn't appear to be any blood splatter on the frames. John believes that's because the pictures were placed there after Paula was shot. But unfortunately, the police never actually collected the photographs at the crime scene. So we don't know whose fingerprints are on them. Correct. Blood splatter was found on his sister's hands, but strangely, one of those hands was under the comforter. I mean, how does blood get on the hand? when the hand is under the cover, if in fact it was a suicide. Well, if you're putting... Once you're dead and you shoot yourself in the head, you can't put your hand under the cover, Ron. Correct. I think she put her hands up in some kind of a defensive fashion. The morning of Paula's death, detectives took samples from her hands to test for gunshot residue. But the swabs were never processed. 
until her brother forced the state crime lab to do it. The results of that test? Paula had no gunshot residue on her hands. But neither did Koloski. Well, Koloski had plenty of time to wash his hands. But if she committed suicide, she would have had gunshot residue on her hands. Because of an unusual request by the 911 operator, the location of the gun Paula allegedly used to kill herself provided no clues in the case. So what I want to do is get the gun away from her, okay? So I want you to put it somewhere safe, and I want you to go sit out on your front step and wait for the police department, okay? Why would a 911 operator tell Robert Koloski to pick up the gun and move it? I, I, I don't understand that. We never could understand that. Despite the evidence and questions uncovered by John, police still wouldn't reopen the case. Within 10 months of Paula's death, John asked a retired detective to look at his findings. It only took a few days to hear back. He calls me Friday at 7 o'clock. He said, we need to talk. John says that detective told him his sister didn't commit suicide. She was likely murdered and the crime scene was staged. The detective then convinced attorney Steve Reck to take the case. When he showed me the facts and I first looked at it, I said, there's no way that Paula Koloski could have killed herself. And if Paula didn't commit suicide, everyone agreed her husband Robert must know more than he was telling. And one of the only ways to get him to talk, a wrongful death lawsuit. To try to get the facts out that the police never got. Before the lawsuit could be filed, a judge needed to remove Robert Koloski as administrator of his wife's estate. Koloski fought back, accusing his former brother-in-law of trying to ruin his reputation and ruin him financially. In the end, after hearing the evidence uncovered by Paula's brother, the judge sided with him, and Robert Koloski lost control of his late wife's estate. In the next year, Steve Reck began digging into Robert and Paula's finances at the time of her death. And what he found was astounding. The forensic accountant found that at the time of her death, uh, Mr. Kowalski owed $190,000 in personal uh, credit card debt. $190,000. $190,000. The debt was spread out over 41 different credit cards. How do you even get 41 credit cards? I, I have no idea. So what was he spending the money on? To this day, no one looking into the case knows. They were all cash advances. Rex says Paula made a respectable middle-class income working at an insurance agency. But Robert was writing thousands of dollars of checks from the couple's joint account, floating the cash pulled from the credit cards. Now, these are copies of the checks right here, and this is just a sample. John, it's got to be stunning for you to look at this. It, it, it's, it's stunning. And to whom are those checks written? The checks are written to numerous credit card companies and various organizations. Rec believes Paula had found out about her husband's debt. He says not long before her death, she took over the checking account. Then, two days before the death, Robert Kalaski started writing checks again out of that account from a different check series. So another packet of checks. Exactly. Evram Spretcher represented Robert Kalaski in the wrongful death lawsuit. He was in debt up to his eyeballs. Well, you say that. I, I, well, do not, I, I don't recall proof. that being the case, though perhaps it was. Despite what Steve Reck says is proof of Koloski's debt, Spretcher wouldn't confirm it. Dozens of credit cards. I am not really uh, Cash aware advances. that I'm not aware that at the time that lawsuit was begun uh, that that was the case. Koloski's attorney could be correct, because by the time the wrongful death lawsuit was filed in 2004, Koloski's debts should have all been wiped clean with money he got after his wife's death. What did he stand to gain from this insurance policy? Uh, about $450,000. 450000 Yeah, about 450000 I don't know about the debt, and I don't know that that $400,000 figure is, is accurate. But John Carbo was now convinced that his sister did not take her own life. He believes Koloski's enormous debt and Paula's life insurance policy leads only to one conclusion. So you think he killed your sister? Absolutely. An allegation his brother-in-law has always vehemently denied. 
The violent deaths of not one but two of Robert Koloski's wives have left many people wondering, could it really be just a coincidence? What are the odds of one wife committing suicide with a gun to the head and the other dying of blunt trauma to the head in the same house within 19 years? That's a... It raises it's, 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 it's probably something you don't see very frequently. Based on this Facebook post from Robert, even some of his own friends may be starting to doubt his innocence. It reads in part, just to let everyone know I'm alive and well. Need to hear from friends, which I don't think I have anymore. One person standing by Robert, attorney Avram Sprecher. What do you think the odds are he killed his first wife? Zero. Second wife? You know, I really don't know anything about, about it at all except reading a small article in the paper. Sprecher represented Robert in the wrongful death lawsuit filed against him by John Carbo. Carbo is convinced his sister Paula Koloski was murdered and the crime scene staged. The lawsuit meant Robert would have to answer questions under oath about Paula's death, something he never had to do since cops ruled her death a suicide. Describe that experience of sitting face to face with Robert Koloski and asking him specifically what happened that fateful morning. Well, he knew at this point that we had gathered the facts and we knew the case up and down. We were ready for this deposition and we have been waiting for it for a long, long time. But their excitement faded fast as the questioning got underway. Do you recall what time you woke up on February 13th? No, I didn't recall. Do you recall what your wife was doing when you woke up? No, I can't. Do you recall what you did after you woke up? No, I can't. Almost every question asked, the answer was the same. Do you recall finding your wife in bed with blood all around the bed? No, I have no recollection. Do you recall whether or not you went into the bedroom and picked up a gun? No, I cannot recall. One thing Robert Koloski did remember and was certain of, he didn't kill his wife. Do you recall whether or not you shot your wife in the head? No, I did not. Well, if you have absolutely no recollection that morning, then how can you tell me here today that you did not shoot your wife in the head? Because I know I did not. And how do you remember that? It's a fact. Koloski also offered a reason why he may have had memory loss. I cannot recall solely from the trauma, the shock, uh, the upset of the day, the time telling me that you cannot remember what occurred on that day because you were in shock? I was told I was. He claims an officer at his house the morning of his wife's death is the one who made the diagnosis. What did the trooper look like that instructed you that you were in shock? I can't recall. Was it a male or a female? It was a male. Were you treated for shock? No. Paula's brother John claims Robert received around $400,000 following his sister's death. It was a combination of insurance money, uh, 401k money, money from the inheritance of my mother's estate. But Robert claims the amount he received was far less. What's the amount that you benefited from as the result of your wife's death? I could probably give a guesstimate. And it would be? I'm guessing about $180,000. Your answer is $180,000? Yes, I can guess. That's the case. That's the recollection. recollection. Right. Could have been $380,000. I highly doubt it. Whatever the amount was, five years later, it was now all gone. Okay, is that money still in your savings account? Mm -hmm. No, it is not. Where is it now? Went with expenses. Expenses? What does that mean? Uh, funeral expenses, um, upgrade vacations with my son other purchases, vehicles. John Carbo believes Koloski used the money to pay off his debts. To the tune of $195,000 in credit card debt. The wrongful death lawsuit never went to trial. Robert Koloski settled for around $90,000. The majority of that money went to a college fund for his son. With the settlement, do you believe you won that case? I think that Mr. Koloski, as far as what he might have had to pay in damages, won the case. For John Carbo and Steve Reck, it was never about the money. 
They were hoping that the deposition would get the case reopened and eventually lead to charges, but that never happened. Have detectives at the Connecticut State Police ever asked to see that deposition video? We've given it to them, but I don't know if anybody's ever watched it. Now that a second wife is dead, they're hoping someone will. I would ask the state now that his second wife has been murdered to go back to look at that video deposition, to look at the financial records, to gather all the facts, and to reopen Paula Kalowski's case. It appears that could be what Connecticut State Police are now doing. Has the Connecticut State Police reached out to you? Yeah, I've had three conversations with the police, uh, each conversation 10, 15 minutes. Uh, they asked me about the financials uh, in the in the Paula's case. Evidence uncovered by Carbo did help to get his sister's official cause of death changed from suicide to undetermined. Was that a partial victory for you? Partial. Yeah, partial. Robert Kolosky's attorney at the time claims the change didn't mean much. I uh, spoke with the medical examiner who did the autopsy, and he explained to me that this is not uncommon, that <clears throat> families very frequently come and argue for a change, and he told me the reason that it was done was that there was no suicide note, and there wasn't, to his knowledge, a history of depression. That was it. With so much suspicion surrounding Robert Kolosky, I wanted to give him a chance to tell his side of the story. So I stopped by the infamous home on North Mudis Road where his two wives were both found dead. Mr. Kolosky. Are you there? It's Chris Hansen with Crime Watch Daily. With FedEx notices piling up at the door, it was pretty clear that Robert hadn't been home in quite some time. And I can certainly understand why. I gotta tell you, it's pretty eerie standing outside the home where the two women, the wives of the same man, both died. Attorney Steve Reck believes one of those deaths could have been prevented. If Paula's case had been handled properly, would Sandra be alive today? Absolutely, because Robert Kolaski would be in jail. You believe that wholeheartedly? Absolutely. No, he could sue you for saying that. He can sue me, but I'm immune if I'm telling the truth, and the truth is he killed both of his wives. Come and sue me, Robert Kolaski. I'm ready for you. Do you think this latest death could help reopen your sister's case? My sister now has a voice, and people are beginning to at least listen uh, to this case. Carbo is hopeful that after nearly two decades, his sister will finally have her day in court. I do believe that the facts that exist should be put before a jury. I mean, th that's my understanding of our system. Let the jury make the determination if you don't know. And I would be very happy with that.